Pittsburgh Steelers edge rusher TJ Watt is undeniably one of the greatest athletes on this planet. He's reached a mythical being kind of status in the NFL, and it's stunning in hindsight how he was passed on 29 times in the 2017 NFL Draft. But did you know that TJ Watt was one college injury away from quitting football and pursuing a potential firefighting career? Even a gridiron monster like TJ Watt has a humanizing story. Ah. Ah. And that's what I'm going to share with you guys today. It's officially that time for a Steelers life story video. Grab a drink, relax, and enjoy the rise of TJ Watt. Trent Jordan Watt was born on October 11, 1994 in Pewaukee, Wisconsin to his parents Connie and John Watt. Now I'd say TJ was born into a very genetically gifted family, but <laughs> That feels like an understatement. You see, he's got these two older brothers. First, there's Derek Watt, who's 6'2", 234 pounds. You probably know him as the former Pittsburgh Steelers fullback. Then you have JJ Watt, who's 6'5", 288 pounds. You know him as three-time Defensive Player of the Year, future Hall of Fame defensive end, formerly of the Texans and Cardinals. And TJ certainly wasn't lacking in the genetics department, being 6'4", 251 pounds. Now it's one thing for them to be giant human beings now at their age, but the thing with the Watt brothers, they were always huge. In fact, their mom revealed that the doctors had to break TJ and JJ's collarbones just so they could fit through their mom's birth canal. At nearly nine pounds, TJ was still the smallest newborn. And being the youngest, TJ was always a couple years behind his older brothers. However, his parents knew the minute, the second he could, TJ would become involved with sports. In fact, TJ's mom jokes that her kids have never seen a Disney movie, but by the age of two have held every kind of ball known to man. Now we all know TJ is a monster on the gridiron that nobody wants to face. However, football wasn't the first sport the Watt brothers fell in love with. You see, growing up, these kids all loved the game of hockey. There's even the story of the Watt family leaving the hospital after TJ was born so they could take JJ to hockey practice. With TJ being the youngest, he always looked up to his older brothers and he always wanted to be doing what they were doing. So naturally, as soon as he was old enough, TJ took up hockey and loved it. However, anyone who grew up playing hockey knows how time consuming that can be. TJ said his family was all over the place. There were times where John would be in New York with Derek, Connie would be in Canada with JJ, and TJ would be at home with grandma and grandpa. TJ told a story about how he used to resent his parents because when he was eight, he finally made the hockey travel team. And coincidentally, that was the same year their family decided to walk away from the sport. The family did love hockey, but they did not love how much the family was separated by hockey. This was very tough on TJ, but honestly, it was a good decision for the family. And hey, with TJ being a star in the NFL now, it all works out. With hockey out of the picture, football became the focus for TJ. Connie says football was TJ and his brother's second love. And John Y, he played football in college, but even he'll tell you that he didn't love it as much as his sons do. In Pewaukee, fifth grade is the earliest kids are able to play football with helmets and pads on, so that's when TJ started. With the Watt brothers being freaks of nature, these guys had to eat like freaks of nature. And there's some funny and intriguing stories in that department as well. Yeah, they always tell stories about how they would go through multiple gallons of milk per week, but that's easy. Here's an even more interesting story. And this should give you guys an idea of how much these kids ate. Connie Watt told a story saying, the kids would eat a hot breakfast in the morning. I would make them PB&J sandwiches to have as a snack at 10 a.m. By second grade, they were eating double lunches at school. I called the school and said, I don't know who we're feeding, but my bill is reflecting more children than I have. And they said, no, ma'am, your kids are eating double lunch. Connie says, are they actually eating it? And they told her they were. Then they would come home from school and have a meal. And then at about eight at night, my husband and I would return to the kitchen and make another full meal for them. They weren't ever having frozen pizza or anything. It was always a big meal at four and eight at night. TJ gave his own perspective on this story. He would go to school and ask the other kids, what'd you have for breakfast? Oh, I had cereal this morning. You didn't get an omelet like I did? <laughs> Kids, man, they're hilarious. TJ's parents made sure to feed their kids well so they would grow up big and strong. TJ and his brothers would eat breakfast, lunch, and multiple dinners a night. You gotta eat to grow, and that's exactly what happened. With TJ and his brothers all going to the University of Wisconsin, their parents continued to make them meals and even showed them how to cook. This was a very tight-knit family. Their parents knew what their kids wanted and needed and did everything in their power to help those kids pursue those goals. However, as tight-knit as this family was, there was still obvious age gaps between the brothers. JJ was a little more than five years older than TJ. 
so he was always off doing high school stuff while TJ was still in grade school. TJ says that made him a lot closer with Derek, who's only about two years older than TJ. In grade school, TJ would always play about two years up on Derek's baseball and football teams, forging an even deeper bond between these two brothers. However, make no mistake, the Watt brothers are still super competitive with each other. Their stories of them playing hockey with each other, sticks were flying, things were nearly turning into punches thrown. But this was commonplace for TJ and his brothers. It was all love, just featuring a passionate flame within them. TJ may have been JJ and Derek's little brother, but when he played sports with the bigger kids growing up, John would always tell him, don't go easy on TJ, don't go easy on TJ. And this forced TJ to have to find his own way to gain a competitive advantage over the older kids. Lessons like these were a chisel that carved TJ into the monster he is today. At Pewaukee High School, TJ was a multi-sport athlete playing baseball, basketball, track and field, and the sport we'll be focusing on, football. Now in high school, TJ Watt played only one position. What was that position? Athlete. TJ was a punter, linebacker, tight end, and a quarterback? And he was a dang good football player at each of those positions. After a breakout junior year, the University of Wisconsin offered him a scholarship as a tight end. Following in his brother's footsteps, TJ accepted that offer immediately. What's really interesting is the fact that TJ was primarily a quarterback his senior year of high school, throwing for 527 yards and 7 touchdowns, running for 554 yards and 9 touchdowns, and he also registered 42 tackles and 5 sacks as a linebacker. But no, TJ committed to play for the Wisconsin Badgers as a tight end of all things. With that being said, it actually took TJ quite a while to actually see the field on Saturdays. In 2013, TJ redshirted his freshman year at Wisconsin to fill out his frame and he spent that year as a scout team tight end where he gave the starting defense a lot of trouble. TJ said he was mossing people at those practices. If anyone has that tape, please send it my way. After the 2013 season, bold prep began. For those who don't know how it works, today redshirts are only allowed to participate in up to four games in a season, and in doing so, that year won't count against that player's four years of college football eligibility. Back in 2013, however, the rules were very different. If a redshirt player plays in just the bowl game, that counts against them as an entire year of eligibility. The thing is, since bowl games are effectively meaningless, many starters often didn't suit up for the bowl games. So instead of burning a player's redshirt year, they just ramp up the amount of reps they get in practice for bowl games. Now this is where things went south for TJ Watt. During prep for the 2013 Rose Bowl, TJ was participating in a blocking drill. TJ plants his right leg and that knee flexes into a valgus position and his kneecap slid in the other direction. TJ hobbled over to the sideline hoping he would be okay, but little did he know, this injury caused what would end up being a very weird career for him at Wisconsin. TJ suffered what's called a patellar subluxation, which on its own is a partial dislocation of the kneecap in layman's terms. Where things got worse is the fact that this subluxation tore TJ's MPFL, his medial patellofemoral ligament. Fortunately, this is an injury that just requires a ton of rest. So no biggie, right? TJ, he can just rest up and prepare himself for the 2014 season, right? Spring practice for the 2014 season, boom. Same injury, patellar subluxation, partial kneecap dislocation, torn MPFL, this time on his left knee. Weird, but it's a different knee, so he could just rest up that knee too and he should be good to go for the 2014 season. Yeah, you know where this is going. Fall camp, preparation for the 2014 season, same injury, patellar subluxation, partial kneecap dislocation, this time on his right knee again. However, this time around, the MPFL he hurt the first time just got torn and even more deteriorated. This time, TJ needed surgery, and the Texans team doctor, Walt Lowe, grafted him a new right MPFL ligament with a cadaver hamstring. And just like that, TJ just lost two years of college football action. He redshirted his 2013 season, and he spent the 2014 season injured. And it was around this time his brother Derek was dealing with a foot injury. So the Watt parents moved to a nearby hotel, they took care of Derek and TJ, took him to rehab, took him to classes, just parent stuff. TJ's rehabbing, and guys, you're never going to guess what happens next. Yeah, you can. Spring practice, preparation for the 2015 season, another blocking drill. He feels his left knee buckle, he recognizes the pain, it's the same exact injury, once again, on his left leg. 
Now, off the cuff, these may just seem like crazy freak injuries, coincidences, but what makes this injury interesting is the fact that after the MPFL is torn the first time, it doesn't heal as strongly as it used to be, which is why recurrent kneecap dislocation occurs in a high percentage of these patients who deal with this injury. So to the more educated eye, the fact that this injury happened twice on each knee isn't really a shock. TJ calls his dad from the stadium. Dad, it happened again. It happened again, dad. John struggled to find encouraging words to tell TJ that everything would all work out because frankly, neither of them knew if everything would work out. TJ got surgery again on his left knee and had to seriously evaluate his future in football. In just two seasons, TJ suffered four injuries total to both his knees. His confidence was crushed and this just kept on happening. However, there was always one glimmer of hope. If recovery goes well, he could still make it back in time for the 2015 college football season. TJ came to the conclusion that he wasn't going to let knee injuries stop him from pursuing his dream career. At the same time, however, he did consider this his last shot at football. One more serious injury and the TJ Watt we know and love today might actually be a firefighter right now, following in his father's footsteps. His mentality was to put all his eggs in one basket to play this college football season. He committed to eating right, sleeping well, and going hard in rehab. Now, one thing he did differently after his left knee surgery compared to his right knee is that this time he wore a knee brace and got way more rest. He didn't walk around on his left leg post-surgery. He would ice his knee every night after rehab with Derek and did everything he could to stay motivated. He found a ton of motivational videos on YouTube that got him through the process, but none more helpful than videos by Dr. Eric Thomas, a world-renowned motivational speaker. TJ says he can recite those videos by heart and how those videos changed his life, he changed where he is today. Enter Tim Tibizar and Paul Christ, Wisconsin's outside linebackers coach and rookie head coach respectively. Coach Chris had been doing his homework on TJ. He noticed that his recurring injury happened whilst blocking or moving backwards. And his solution was quite simple. Put TJ in a situation where he'd be doing way less moving backwards. Coach Chris suggested to Tibizar that he switch to defense and be a pass rusher. He said, if you're gonna have a Watt on your team, it's not a bad idea to have him on defense. However, you gotta understand, this isn't Madden. These are humans we're talking about. You gotta know that when you suggest to a player that they switch positions, you run the risk of offending them. What, I'm not good enough to play this position? I'm not good enough to play this position? You want me to play this position? You risk harming your relationship with him. And that's what Paul Chris was worried about. He consulted with JJ, who also switched from tight end to defense back in college. JJ told Chris that outside linebacker felt like a perfect fit for TJ. And he explained that, unlike on offense, on defense you have the opportunity to affect the game on every single play. Theoretically, you can get to the ball on every single play. And that philosophy fits with TJ's mentality very well. Coach Chris bounced the idea off of TJ to switch positions, and initially, it hurt TJ's ego a little bit. What, I'm not good enough to be a tight end? With that said, TJ still asked for the rest of the day to think about this decision. He consulted with his parents and JJ only to find that Chris had already run that idea past them. They all thought switching positions was a great idea for TJ, so he officially made the switch. Coach Tibizar welcomed TJ to the OLB room, and TJ was excited about the switch, with his only worry being his experience, his lack of experience rather. He told Coach Tibizar, Coach, I don't even know how to get into an outside linebacker's stance, but Tibizar told him, hey, we'll get you there, don't worry. During the Badgers 2015 fall camp, the starters helped TJ get up to speed. Former Steelers and Badgers teammate Joe Schobert said that you could tell TJ was catching on really quickly. It was going to take reps, but he had the tools and he'd be a force if kept progressing. The 2015 college football season began and TJ finally saw his first college football action on kick return. Week after week, however, TJ continued to make impact plays on special teams and practice, and the coaches took notice to this. Derek and Coach Chris were standing together on a sideline during a September game where they watched TJ make a huge tackle. Derek cheered and Coach Chris was thinking to himself that, hey, this TJ kid should be playing more. TJ was making plays and he looked at home. Towards the end of the season, Badgers defensive coordinator Dave Aranda installed a 2-4-5 defensive scheme called the Cheetah Package. This means 5 DBs, 4 linebackers, and 2 down linemen. The goal of this package was to get all of Wisconsin's best pass rushers on the field for possession downs. And this package also included TJ as one of those down linemen, and he did very well. He saw more snaps at OLB when a starting outside linebacker had to replace an injured middle linebacker pushing TJ outside. 
TJ played a role in Wisconsin being the nation's number one scoring defense, allowing only 13.7 points per game. During the offseason, JJ came down and spent hours among hours with TJ, sharing everything he knows regarding watching tape. Growing up, TJ was always in JJ's shadow, and he hated it. Oh, I'm not JJ, don't call me JJ, don't treat me like JJ. As TJ got older, however, he became way more mature and understood how valuable of a resource it is to have JJ frickin' Watt available to you at your discretion. TJ eventually accepted JJ as a mentor figure, and that's when TJ began to put it all together as a pass rusher. TJ's 2016 season at Wisconsin was as dominant as JJ's was, putting up 63 total tackles, 11 and a half sacks, two forced fumbles, four pass defenses, a pick six, and a win over Western Michigan in the Cotton Bowl. TJ was primed to go to the NFL, but he wasn't expected to go on day one due to his lengthy injury history and having only been a starter for one year in college. The 2017 NFL Draft arrives and he was selected by the Pittsburgh Steelers 30th overall. This was a pretty good fit for TJ as the Steelers run a defensive scheme similar to Wisconsin. With that said, TJ had some serious competition ahead of him to see some playing time. Who was that competition? Oh, it's only James Harrison, you know, one of the strongest and most physical pass rushers in NFL history. Shortly before the start of the 2017 season, however, TJ was named the starting right outside linebacker across Bud Dupree, demoting the Steelers legend James Harrison to a relief pitcher role. He was the first Steelers rookie in 29 years to start at outside linebacker, and after naming TJ the starter, they never looked back. He made an immediate impact on the team in his Steelers debut versus Cleveland in week one, recording seven tackles, two sacks, a pass defense, and even an interception. He finished his rookie year with 56 tackles, seven sacks, nine pass defenses, a block kick, a forced fumble, and a pick. He had a very promising rookie season. Before 2018, however, the Steelers, TJ, and Bud Dupree all agreed that it's probably best the two players swap sides. TJ returned to left outside linebacker the position he dominated at in college. And that's when TJ really started to dominate in the NFL. He became the Steelers defense. Literally, the Steelers are only one in 10 when TJ isn't on the field. This defense revolves around the ability of TJ Watt. Ever since that position change, TJ Watt has gotten better and better and better, becoming the, if not one of, the greatest football players on this planet. In 2020, TJ was snubbed for the Defensive Player of the Year award, and 2021 is when he showed why that was a mistake. Due to contract negotiations, TJ exercised his leverage to play more of a coach's role during the offseason. He didn't want to get himself hurt in practice before getting his big payday. His agents wanted him to ask for more money, but TJ made a business decision and he and the Steelers came to a four-year, $112 million contract agreement, cementing himself as the highest paid defender at the time. And TJ, after not practicing at all during the offseason, rewarded the Steelers finally. In less than 15 games, he recorded 64 tackles, 5 forced fumbles, 3 fumble recoveries, 7 pass defenses, 11 stuffs, and tying Michael Strahan's sack record, recording a league-leading 22.5 sacks. Many would argue he actually had that 23.5 sacks and the broken record, but the NFL considers his 23rd sack as just a tackle due to it coming after an aborted play. Now stats are one thing, but when you watch TJ on the field, he was single-handedly changing the outcomes of games. TJ had a monster 2021 season, finally earning that Defensive Player of the Year honor. It's still a little too soon to say for certain, but if he continues to produce the way he does, all signs point to him eventually making his way into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Shortly before his fourth knee surgery at Wisconsin, TJ grabbed a notebook and wrote down some huge goals, bulk up to 250 pounds, run a sub 4 7 40 yard dash, be named first team all Big Ten, get drafted in the first round, and he accomplished all of those goals. Now that's already awesome and inspiring, but in that same notebook, he wrote something that's way more moving than any of that. And what was it he wrote? In big block letters, he wrote, why not me? You guys, I want to thank you for watching the rise of TJ Watt. These are all big projects that I love putting together. I love sharing the life stories of all these players with you guys into big, awesome kind of documentary style videos. I hope you enjoyed it. 
a lot of work went into this one. If you want to help out with this show, if you want to help me turn this show into my full-time job, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Devin Engel, D-E-V-I-N-E-N-G-L-E, or you can hit the join button under this video. Both of those, you can join for as little as a dollar a month. Those help me, I guess, pursue my goal of turning this show into my full-time job and moving to Pittsburgh, PA. That's my biggest life dream. That's what I'm pursuing in life. This is my life's work. Hope you enjoy it. My name's Devin Engel. Let me know who you want to see next, what documentary, what life story you want to see next. I want to thank some new patrons and YouTube members over on the Patreon side of things. We got Lucy Gomez joining the $1 tier. And on the YouTube side of things, we got Lorenzo Canal joining the $2 tier. I appreciate both of you. I'm Devin Engel. I'm the Steelers storyteller. Let me know who you want to see next. I love you. I appreciate you. Hope you have a good one. Here we go.